I am unashamed. What about you? Welcome back to Unashamed. We got a full house. We're stacked in here like cordwood. We got Zach in the house, Jace. I here. mean, like we're not having to worry about him being late because he's here. You me tell you, funny. no technical problems. <laughs> I mean, you're sitting in the I'm chair. Here. You're here. You mean to start this pa- podcast? And we have Lisa. Zach, I've never asked you. Oh well, I <laughs> yeah. feel like this is going to be a what challenge. What do you do? What do I do? What do you do? <laughs> what do you you're do? You're always over there on the edge. <laughs> Taking a little heat. Uh, that's, I, I can't wait to hear this answer. I found what, what do you what, do? What, what does a man do for a living? I uh, I work with people with very interesting personalities, <laughs> and I try to I try to wrangle them. That's the funniest question I've ever heard. Interesting personalities. <laughs> interesting personalities. <laughs> what most do you of them do? are Robertsons. Oh, do I, I don't know. What do man. you do? I, 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 Import export buy and sell. I don't know. He's like Art <laughs> Vandelay. He's he's in the import export business. That's funny. Well, I was going to tell you a funny story and okay. a scary story to start the podcast. Ooh, so, okay, you ready? I'm ready. The funny story is when I pulled up out into the we can't call it a parking lot in the, front of here. The area at which we parked deep into the woods, and Zach got out and had his son and they walked by me as they were going into the lair and I looked up and I thought to myself in the moment, who is that? (laughs) (laughs) You saw me? You walked by. You saw me. I was I was listening to worship music and he walked in and I thought, Who's that? Who's that? So, so re- Zach, you've had two things. Dad asked what you do. Jay's asked who you are. I don't feel that's, like, like you know Apparently, know you me. need to come down here a little more. I don't more. feel like you know <laughs> I just didn't recognize you in the moment. It's been a while since. Uh, Did you not know I was, I was coming in town? I'm sure someone told me, but. <laughs> <laughs> when I come in town, I make, it a, I make it a point to stop by and say hello. I don't drive by. Now, this is yeah, the man yeah. that blows his horn on interstate a mile from where you yeah, live my, as a hello. Because it would have been by. too much trouble to take a... Uh, know, yeah, who could get yeah, off that exit? It would take two so minutes to get there. I'm so bitter about that. <laughs> I, I, it was an it's act. Like, we're family. Of, it was an act of greeting. It beats nothing. That's right? true. Just no, it barely. Doesn't, it doesn't beat nothing because he didn't hear it. <laughs> That's right. So it didn't beat anything. <laughs> but he knew It I'd, just annoyed the person beside you. Now he did call and tell me that he He, he oh, knew yeah. I did it. <laughs> I, it. It's like... You know, you give someone a gift, and then they don't like how it was wrapped or what yeah. was inside. So I don't know. Well, when um, I got out of the parking lot, if we're not, not going to call it gift. a parking lot out here, but I step out of my truck, and I forget. I mean, it's like a bunch of bamboo with weeds. Grow. I mean, I, I, it looked like a snake fest out there. I don't know if I've, it's kind out of here. Big. Yeah. Oh. It, Zach, this whole area is I know. I, I, I forgot. <laughs> I, I mean, I've been gone from Louisiana for Everything six years. around where we're sitting will hurt yeah, you. That's, I just you know, there's got to be a cotton. I've been somewhere. stung before on the set, so that tells you right now. So, so the, what's your scary story? Scary story was, I'm sure y'all were. Although behind. that's pretty scary that you don't even know your own cousin, but. No, that was funny. Yeah. I the scary that. part was, I feel like I'm free rolling now. So we're going to get some good material because on the way down here, right when I made the last turn, I looked up, and there was a uh, one of these trucks that Phil has given an accurate description of. It looked like a mad spider, kind of that all reared up. Yeah. Y'all, yeah. y'all passed this truck because you were behind me, but when I looked up, he was in my lane, going at a pretty stay rapid. in your lane, bro. And so I started moving over in the three seconds that I thought I'm fixing to die. <laughs> And he just kept coming. He was not, I looked, I could tell he was looking down, but the truck was careening toward me. So I navigated out in front of uh, Jimmy the Rednecks. Yeah. Empire? Yeah. Yeah. It's an empire there. I literally. It's a Sanford and Son-esque empire. Went up it's against the fence. I went beyond off the road. Oh, all the way to Because he was right coming there. off the road on my lane. Yeah. Actually, and, uh, that would have been a good place to honk your horn. Yeah. <laughs> there was no time for the horn honking. Yeah, instead of at your cousin, right? Yeah, yeah a mile I just away. careened, bounced. I wasn't did going he never that even fast. saw you, did he? 
I looked back and I saw a hand go up. And I think that was I'm sorry. My, my bad. bad. Yeah. I almost killed you. Yeah. <laughs> Is it that or raise a hallelujah? I don't know what that was. So it wasn't I get back on the road. I had uh, to come to a full stop because I was fixing to hit Jimmy Red's dump truck that was parked twenty yards. Well the to problem the right of the road. with living out in the middle of nowhere is that you're used to not having a lot of people on the road. So yeah. you get very loose. So I notice people on their phones looking down, messing with their radio, because you can drift back and forth, and typically it doesn't bother you, unless someone's coming in the other lane. Unless it does. I came this close. Phil, in fact, I, it was for the a, listeners, there's it, a quarter of an inch. Yeah, very small, quarter of an inch. Reference. Yeah. It was a hit. You know, we're like it's a side swipe. 12 o'clock at night, I just got off an airplane, Miss Kay was with me, and we're, we're in this lane, and here comes this lane. <laughs> And we see this vehicle. This was a traumatic thing. Coming out, they yeah. were coming failing. straight at me. So, so I started slowing down. I told Miss Kay, I said, "Hold on," because they were just coming. Well, when they got about ten feet or less, still coming. Whoever it was, I don't know what they were doing, but they were just coming. Well, I just took a hard right like this, and they went like this, and they barely scraped my tail end in the vehicle. Actually hit your back tire. And they hit my back tire. Yep. It went flat instantly. So I went down. But but and then they were they something they must have just woke up. So they come back off of it and went by me. I couldn't chase them to say Look what you And you, you really did didn't truck. need to, Dad. <laughs> no. You know, I think you're Not chasing people Bill. down days are over. You probably just had to let that go. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'd let it go. I'd... What's funny is, Dad, about that story, so you've told it before, but I hadn't mentioned lately that Mom, when Mom tells me the story, she says, well, I saved our lives last night. I said, <laughs> what What happened? She said, oh, we were on our way home. Your dad wasn't paying attention. <laughs> and I said, Bill, there's a car in the other sheet. Oh, I paid <laughs> t- attention when that car started coming out of there. Mom took to full me. credit for it. It was your... coming just like this. I did that, and they were just. We're having a reenactment if you're listening. Oh, yeah. They just barely raked me. The, the state trooper come up there in a few minutes, and he said, Well, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think I. I said, <laughs> I don't know if he says, Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he did. They did try to get in a convenience store. And when dad came up to the store, they had just closed. He looked inside and the woman wouldn't open the door. And dad was like, I was telling her who I was. I said, Dad, you don't look like a guy who opened the door at midnight you know, said, at the yeah. convenience store. I said, Let me borrow you. I didn't have a <laughs> cell phone, I don't own one. So I had no way of Luckily contact. for her, luckily for you, she was calling 911 at the time with you walking yep. up to the yeah. door. So it all worked out. So I got to tell the story that I forgot to tell in the last podcast that uh, one of our sisters at the church, Jerry Ann, she, her sister Mindy has been on our podcast, Mindy Lancaster. Yeah. Amazing story. She, she told her story. So these two, their dad is in prison for life uh, for, for murdering their mom. He was convicted. This is like 25 or 30 years ago. So because they spent so much time visiting him in prison, they now do prison ministry. It's amazing. So they go, there's a women's prison about an hour from here. Well, this past week, they baptized 100 women Wow! in one night. I mean, they've been going over and sharing, and all of a sudden, it was just revival in the prison. And so so she, this sister, Jerry Ann, she's telling me, Dad, that she, she said, we baptized so many people when I went home. She said, I was dreaming that I was still baptizing people in my dream. You know, she said, I just couldn't stop, I guess. And 100 people is a lot of people to baptize. Yeah. This is back first century. Yeah. She said, but in my dream, your dad comes up while I'm baptizing these women. And I said, I said, my dad came up? She said, yeah. And he said, I heard about what happened, and I want y'all to baptize. I want you to baptize me. And she said, why? And he's, you said in her dream, well, I've always wanted to be baptized by a woman. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that was part of the story. <laughs> that, that's I was, what she told I was me. waiting on some let kind just, of like significant. <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> but I got so tickled. It was I like, went to Angola. We did preach the gospel. We did. And they did. They, I was with you. The, uh, that's where her dad's The man at, who right? heads uh-huh. what's, the, what's the main dog? What they call oh, uh, Burl. Burl Kane, Kane he, used to be the warden. Yeah, he's not he's there a, anymore. He's in Mississippi now. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing man who did an amazing job at Angola. So a lot of lifers were baptized over well, there. Well, they were piping that into the death row. And, yeah. Uh, you know, all, everybody got it on the live feed. But I, I've said this before, Dad. I'll say it again before we get to our text. But the uh, 
you said one of the best opening lines ever. And of course, we're in Angola, and we went through several doors clanging behind us to get where we were in this camp. And you said you you quoted Galatians. I think it's Galatians three. Is it the whole world's a prisoner of sin, or three or four? And you said you read it, and then you looked up at the camera, and you said, "Just because you're under lock and key doesn't mean that you can't be free." That's right. You, you, that was his opening that's line. A good, that's a good T-shirt right there. Oh, there it is. I was like, "What a line!" And then that whole world's a prisoner of sin was his verse. So yeah, it was like, that is good. It was quite the it's, opening. It's so weird, y'all talking about the prison ministry because I stumbled upon a a pretty neat story last night. I was studying. Or something else, but you know how it goes. Oh, we do have a prison story today. I didn't think I was—I was tied in and didn't even realize it into our text today. We have a prison story. Yeah, the uh-huh. prison break. Exactly. Yeah. That I was studying about the prison break, and one thing led to another. So I'll go ahead and share this because I thought it was interesting. But are you familiar with Charles Colson? He's written a bunch of books. Yes. Yes. Chuck Colson. Chuck Colson. AKA Chuck. I got Charles. Well, well his, Charles the people w. that know him yeah. well call him Chuck. Yeah, his we, friends call him Chuck. He wrote a book with Nancy Piercy called How Then Shall We Live Now, which was kind of a yeah. very pivotal. He wrote the Colson Institute. So uh, I looked at his story. I guess we're talking about the same guy. I'm not sure at this point. Now I'm questioning if we are talking <laughs> uh, about the same so guy. So this guy was a part of Watergate. And he was a, an advisor. Yeah, yeah, that's him. Uh, to uh, Nixon. Nixon, and so and, and and was sentenced to a few months in in prison for his role in that. And so, well, during that time, he he came to the Lord, and so he gets sent off to prison. And what he learned between those two things of coming to the Lord, and then being in prison is that he was he was felt like he was called by God because he saw so much uh I guess the lack of rehabilitation in the prison system. Yeah. It was kind of like uh you're here, throw away the key, these people are hopeless. And so he became the most revolutionary person as far as faith based prison programs that's ever been. And you know, he died in 2012. But all hit the programs that he introduced, yeah, they're what we yeah. go by today. I mean, y'all were just sharing that story about all right. that. Well, a lot of this stuff that he he paved the way for that. And but I ran across an interesting quote he said because the I think it was the Washington Post where they were trying to make fun of him, of course, because they're a political organization, and they were like Charles. Golson is actually saying that his conviction in Watergate turned out to be proof that God is real. Well, you know, I had to read the article. Yeah. I'm like, what, what is this? So I want to read you the quote that spurned the article. And this is the quote. I took a picture of it on my phone. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't planning on getting into this today, but y'all brought it up. And here's the quote. He says, I know the resurrection is a fact. And Watergate proved it to me. How? Question mark. Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Mm. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. And I would even add they went to their death. That's right. Because of it. Every one of them was beaten, tortured, stoned, or put in prison. They would not have endured that if it were not true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep a lie for three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Just think about that statement and you get his point. Yeah. They couldn't keep a lie for three weeks. So you see the point he's making. It's a brilliant point. Yeah. It, it had to be true. <laughs> It wasn't a lie. So, but anyway, the end quote of that is, you're telling me the tw- the 12 apostles could keep a lie for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. And I would add yeah. to that, Washington Post missed the point. <laughs> That's what they do. That they, they they frame up something like that. Uh, bizarre. Quote, these were bizarre. Because they made it yeah. like he was defending Watergate. He didn't defend nah, it. He, he was didn't. defending the resurrection nah, of I Jesus. That's a great point. I mean, you know awesome. what I found, uh, Travis? Hang did. on, before you do that, let's take a break. 
of our favorite sponsors are our good friends at Helix Mattresses, because, uh, Jace, we love our Helixes. Well, I appreciate that today more than most days, because last night I slept on the couch. <laughs> and it had nothing to do with me and my wife and our relationship. I literally I there. Are you in the doghouse again? I literally fell asleep while studying on the couch. And when I woke up, it was daylight. And I didn't appreciate the helix until I tried to get up. <laughs> you felt it in the old back then, right? Pretty much from head to toe. Oh, yeah. So Helix Sleep is the premium mattress. Um they offer 20 unique mattresses, including their award-winning Lux collection. Uh, they have a mattress for big and tall sleepers. They have some for kids uh, as well. Um, when you go to helixsleep.com, you're going to take a quiz, and they're going to find out which one works best for you because everybody's unique. They offer a 100-night free trial, uh, which is great, so you get to make sure that you love it. So uh, I took the Helix Sleep quiz, and I was matched with the Moonlight mattress because I wanted one that was soft. Um, I, I tend to sleep on my back, so you know that's why I chose the one that I chose. Uh, it's been excellent. Lisa and I both love it. Um, you need to try it. They come with a 10 or 15 year warranty, depending on the model. Uh, they're American made, uh, which we love. So check them out. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash unashamed. Use the code helixpartner20. This is their best offer yet. It won't last long with Helix. Better sleep starts now. Go to helixsleep.com slash unashamed. Use the code helixpartner20. What I find a travesty in all this is when they looked at the statistics of the faith-based programs that he introduced, and and, and he received numerous medals from uh, and awards from yeah. President Bush. I mean, later on in life, which always had a controversial angle to it because he was mixed up in Nixon and Watergate. But when you looked at the stats of what he introduced, so and I looked at the current stats, so now when someone is released from prison, 66% of them, two-thirds, end up back in prison. Yeah. So, But the ones that go through a lot of the faith programs that he introduced, well, two-thirds of those yeah. did not come back. So that's the opposite. So it's just yeah, the opposite. It's yeah. just the opposite. And you think, no, why can't? Why can't the world just step back and say, wait a minute, even if you don't embrace yeah. that there is a God and Jesus is the Christ and his argument about this, I think that is very profound about the what the 12 apostles did. Look, look at the facts. Look at the stats. Do we do we want to rehab people in prison or not? Which was Burl Cain, the guy we were talking about earlier, his whole idea about Angola, take one of the worst prisons in America. And it was one of the worst. And it was one of the worst. Yeah. And then say, we want to bring Jesus in here in life change and see what we can do. Uh, Jason added on to that since Colson was around in his material, we've added CRI, which is Celebrate Recovery Inside, which now helps people get off of drugs. Yeah. Because drugs are still rampant in the prison system. So to get them off of drugs, and so when they go back out, you're taking motivation away to get back into crime. So what you're seeing is life change, which mm -hmm. then brings about n not coming back to prison because people that live for Christ don't yeah. live in such a way that you well, wind up going yeah. to jail. I, so I went to Angola um, in a former not life. as an inmate, not as an inmate. Okay. This is back as a congressional candidate. Um, I did that one time, which was never again. But we're glad you didn't win. Yeah, glad I didn't win. But uh, I went and toured Angola because it was part of the uh, the district here, and and I had this incredible moment there. A couple of incredible moments. One is the fact that they have, um, I think, in New Orleans um, Theological Seminary has their training pastors inside. Yeah, they have a satellite. Uh, Campus and they've inside they, and go and they've ordained many yeah you know, many pastors and planted churches in other prisons around Louisiana. And they have they have churches that they built physical yeah. buildings and churches that they've established inside of Angola. We met him. Which is just like you're, you're and you're looking at this and you're like, man, this is incredible. They have this community thing going on and and at one moment I was standing there. I may have told this story in the podcast. I can't remember. I'm standing there with. Um, it wasn't Warden Kane. It was a. It was War. I was. I can't remember her name. But we're standing there. And it's me and this probably hundred and ten pound lady, and then no guards. 
and we're at the where they have the horses and everything, and there's probably thirty five inmates doing different things, and and I'm like, I felt really safe, but there's no guards, yeah. and I was like, hey, what are, like, are these all kind of the petty thief criminals? Like, what what are all these guys in here for? They said, well, most of these guys here, uh, she's looking around. She said, yeah, most of these guys are in here for murder. Because it's our mm-hmm. it's our maximum prison. Yeah, and so I'm looking, and I'm just in a. I was like, it was just the weirdest feeling that I felt safe, and there was no guards. And I was like, where are the guards? So, oh no, these guys are awesome. Like that, these are like, but it was because the programs that you mentioned that most mm-hmm. of these guys had gone changed through their life. had changed their life. They had a mechanics program that, but all of the, a lot of this stuff was faith based. And one of the guys in the, that ran the mechanic shop there, he's like, look. He said, you get in here for life, man. He said, you start looking for purpose. And and he started just sharing the gospel with me and talked about how he didn't have a father growing up, and he didn't have someone that told him the truth about Jesus. He said, but now, he said, you know what? I got about five sons in here. Young guys have come in here. I'm I'm in here the rest of my life, so I'm going to be a father to these young men that they didn't have, and I'm going to tell them about Jesus. And I, was, I, I mean, I was like tearing up thinking, man, like there is like yeah. kingdom work it's opportunity. going on I had here. the same moment there when we drove by, because this is a huge, I mean, this is how many, how many thousands of acres this whole. Oh, it's an apparatus. It's big. Yeah. And there's a cemetery down there. Mm-hmm. And I drove by that cemetery with all those crosses out there. And as I drove by, I thought, man, this really was the final place for so many people in here because they're there for life. And of course, there are also people are executed there. And I thought, if you can't get it right here, this is your last jumping off place. I mean, of yeah. course you have, this is your last shot. You're not going to get back out into the, most of those guys into society. So you got to make it right. Yeah. I had a similar story. I've shared this before, but it was probably 700 podcasts ago. But, uh, so I spent two years at the pea farm up here, Washington Parish. I remember pea when farm. you did that. And, uh, but my, so you were an inmate? My, was this when you broke no, into that? No, I was yeah, coming is, in. Was this when you tried to as, rob that As a bank? minister of the gospel. <laughs> oh, okay. that, that's the funny part. Y'all, y'all, y'all wouldn't let that breathe. <laughs> let it. Let the joke breathe. And I went in voluntarily, but I had a different take because you said, oh, I felt safe, and I didn't feel safe because they. I went through two mechanical doors and I looked around the first time I went in and I was like, are y'all coming with me? The guards? And they're like, Oh no, we're not going in there. <laughs> You're on your own. You want to do this. <laughs> There's dangerous people in there. <laughs> so I didn't feel safe, but you know, and it led to some, some weird tough moments. You know, we, we finally had a guy come in who had been abused his whole life. You could tell yeah. he, uh, he would take soap. He looked like some kind of uh, mummy from a weird movie because he would put this soap all over him. So it was like like a paste. He did it every time. So he and it was just like crackling off the whole time. And hmm. so one day he'd heard enough and decided, you know, he was gonna he was gonna kill me. And he basically stood up and was like, you know, I've heard enough. And so we just, I looked around like guard, but <laughs> it just, he would have been tough to battle because he would have been very slippery too. To, yeah. I just realized there's no one coming. And I was like, I get it. You're, you know, what I'm sharing the truth of God. I'm sharing Jesus with you. And you've been abused. You've been tortured. You've made bad decisions. You've reacted unfavorably. You have mm-hmm. ended up here. And you know, the, the two worlds that we live in, you know, our father from heaven, who's good and holy. And then you have the, remember when Jesus and John eight, he said, you belong to your father, the devil, you know, mm-hmm. he's a liar and a murderer. And I was like, that, that's the world we live in here. And so you're wanting to take out the messenger. What have I done besides love you? I'm not getting it. I wouldn't get paid to be out here. You know, I'm doing this because I'm like, this this is this is your answer. This is your option. But anyway, but I was like, look, if you if you're gonna kill me, you know, let's do it quickly, or sit down and, and listen. You know, listen to to what I'm trying to share. But fortunately, he didn't. But he was threatening me. And uh, but in the moment, I was scared. I mean, I thought, well, you know, if this is how I go down, yeah. this is how I go down. But I've I've chosen to be here. Uh, with very violent men yep. who are in here. Most of them are in there for murder. And and luckily, you know, 
fortunately, providentially, he didn't kill me. But but I just thought in my mind, when you said that, you said I felt safe. I thought there were moments I did not feel safe. But I just thought either we're going to do this or we're not. Yeah, and that really does set up where we're going to be in our text in Acts chapter 12 because um, last the last podcast is where we left off. We just started introing that. It's one of the reasons why I asked Lisa to be on the podcast today because of where we ended our discussion. Let's take a break before we get into this text. So time, Jace, is one of our most precious commodities. How much you spend a lot of time preparing for this podcast? Is that a fair <laughs> a thing to say? Yes, I was told when we went to Bible school that you can't have the thunder until you have lightning, <laughs> and it was said in the context of speaking yeah. and studying. And so, obviously, the speaking is the thunder. The lightning is the prep and the study. Another thing they told us was that a good preaching was 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. I'm not sure that those numbers are... I disagreed with that one. (laughs) But what they did mean was you do have to spend the time, right? And so one of our sponsors, Hillsdale College, understands that time is precious to you, but you can spend that wisely uh, in proving yourselves in your knowledge. And that's what we do on this podcast. Uh, For them, it's history, economics, great works of literature, the meaning of the U.S. Constitution, uh, things that maybe you didn't get in school, or maybe if you did, you just weren't quite as into it as you are now. That's why I'm so excited that Hillsdale College is offering more than 40 free online courses in the most important and enduring subjects. Um, You can learn about the works of C.S. Lewis, stories in the book of Genesis, the meaning of the U.S. Constitution, the rise and fall of the Roman Republic, which we've talked about a lot in our studies here in Acts, uh, or the history of the ancient Christian church for free. So uh, they recommend especially uh, ancient Christianity. It's 11 lecture course. You study the inspiring stories of Christ and his apostles, much that we're doing uh, here on this podcast as well. The course is self-paced so that you can start whenever and wherever. Enroll now in ancient Christianity to discover the improbable and miraculous story of Christianity. Here's what you do. You go right now to hillsdale.edu slash unashamed to enroll. There's no cost. It's easy to get started. hillsdale.edu slash unashamed to register. I don't even remember where we ended our discussion, so let's me. review. That's why you had me it here. It seemed like a lifetime ago. And that's why you had me. So we, we get to this point in Acts 12, and last time we set up kind of the, the political landscape with this King Herod, and he is now, because it is advantageous to his rule, which most politicians are like this, decides that he's going to get after Christians, he's going to double down. Yeah, And so he kills... James, one of the sons of thunder, uh, James and John, from so he's the first apostle, the first of the of the ones who witnessed the resurrection with Jesus uh, to be killed, and so he's martyred. And so the because people love it, so when he saw in verse three of chapter twelve, this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. So he's taken Peter and he's put him in jail. And uh, as we mentioned before, he uh, the reason he did that was because he's going to kill him. But he can't kill him for eight days because it's at the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and you got the Passovers after that. So he can't do any trial. So we're in a, like an eight-day delay of Peter being in prison. So at the end of our discussion, Jace, we were talking about this thing about why, you know, why does James get martyred here, but Peter doesn't? Because you know he's going to yeah. you know, he's going to break out here uh, supernaturally, which we'll read later in the text. But it led us to one of those really kind of I call it cornerstone discussions about Christianity of why do bad things happen to some people but not others, and it put us kind of into that big question. Because look, everybody's out there listening is going through something, you know, mm-hmm. and so people are praying. Do I get delivered? Do I have to go through a battle? So I mentioned uh, before on a previous podcast that Lisa and I found out that she has breast cancer. And so, like, that's that's something you hear. You obviously don't want to hear that. You know, I just had a month earlier, they thought maybe I had prostate cancer. Well, I didn't. You get that call and they say, everything's negative. You're good. We'll see you in six months. You're like, whoo, okay, thank you, Lord. 
and you just kind of rock on your life. But then you get the call. She gets the call that says it's positive. Yeah. And we're both husband and wife. We're both believers. One of us got the all clear. One of us didn't. So, but we still battle this together. So, mm-hmm. one of the reasons I want to have you on, babe, was to to be able to just tell the audience how you felt about that. And now, as a woman of faith, because that's exactly where we are in this text. This is the church is undergoing this terrible persecution and difficulty. And you know, what did you? How did you feel about it? I mean, tell tell the audience because I know they want to know because they're concerned about you. Well, I think um, at first it was unbelief. It was like. You know, maybe they've made a mistake, but, um, you know, there was, then I had further testing done and there was no mistake. Um, but you know, my initial thing was, well, why not me? I mean, I have so many friends that this has happened to people in the church, um, you know, people all across the world that this has happened to. So why not me? Um, and one of the things that I want to that I want to say about that. And in the pro-life ministry, we talk about the, you know, the lies that, um, you know, the pro-abortion people tell. One of those lies is that, you know, that abortion, it has no consequences to your body, um, to your mind. I mean, you know, it's just like, it's just one of those things. It's just like a, you know, something that happens. And it's so not true because I've told before those three lies that they told me. But one of the things that the pro-life people talk about now is that there is a greater chance for women who have had abortion to have breast cancer. Hmm. And the reason being like is... Like a 34% increase. Oh, wow. Yeah. And this is something you never hear in this you discussion not, about women's health. That's exactly right. But it's true. And one of the reasons why that is, is because whenever you become pregnant, your body starts producing cells to feed your child. So in a woman, that food comes from the breast. And whenever you have an abortion, those cells don't go anywhere. They're still there. They're laying dormant in your body. Um, Whenever you have, um, you know, like you've miscarried or something, your body flushes those cells. Because it's natural. Because it's a natural thing. But your body does not flush it whenever you have an abortion. So I don't know, probably for three years, whenever I've been doing speeches, I've been talking about that. That, you know, another lie they don't tell you is that, you know, women who have had abortion have a greater risk at having breast cancer. And so whenever I first learned that I had this, I thought, well, it makes sense. I mean, why not me? I I am I am one of those people, you know. And then I had another friend say, Oh, but it's not your fault. You don't you don't feel responsible for this, do you? And I was like, No. I I mean, I know where cancer comes from. It comes from the evil one, you know? So no, that's right. So I said, No, I don't feel I don't feel like it's my fault. I don't feel guilty. I don't feel any of that stuff. But at the same time, I feel like this is just another part of my story that God is going to help me to bless other people with, you know, because after I go through this, look, I'm telling everybody, you know, you got to get checked. You got to do this. You got because I don't want anybody to have to go through this. Mm-hmm. But they found mine. I found it. Actually, I felt it. We found it very early. And, of course, I'm not out of the woods yet. I haven't even had surgery. So they don't really know the extent of everything that's in there. This is just from their preliminary things. Um, But, you know, why not me? And I think if we thought about that more, if we thought about, okay, so so I've got this. Now what am I going to do with it? What is my – I think your reaction – is the most important thing whenever you have somebody say, well, you have cancer. So what is your reaction? Well, Mm -hmm. then I'm going to praise God. Missy Williams told me, she said, I grew the most in my joy during my struggle with breast cancer. And I thought, okay, so it's not something you look forward to, but but I'm Mm -hmm. looking forward to growing and 
in well, my ca- walk with it's Jesus. It's kind of cliched, but you always say at the darkest times or when light is needed the most. Yeah. And I think when you walk through something like this, that's when the light shines the brightest. And so people have been there for us, which has been amazing. Uh, I mentioned John 9 last time. Jesus said that when they said, why does something like this happen? He said, so that God will be glorified. And I realize when you're walking through it, it's hard to see that glory. But I'm telling you, when you do it, it's amazing because God gets the glory no matter what. And that makes the resurrection and all this so important. James, the reason that that sword went across his neck and he sacrificed his life and never gave up on the resurrection, Jace, which you mentioned this at the beginning of the podcast, is because he believed he's going to be resurrected. So they can't yeah. take, they can't ultimately take you out. So I think that's where Peter is in this because he's so calm going into this setting. Yeah. Well, I think that's, uh, that's part of the argument that we make because you, when you think, what is the biggest argument against God and faith? I would say it's probably the problem of suffering and evil. Mm-hmm. In, in the world. Especially children, uh, innocent people. We yeah. see it all the time, right? You know, but even these arguments are so uh, convoluted. And like Lisa said, they're full of lies. Uh, I remember a famous quote from, I think it was Darwin, who said, basically, I, I don't remember the exact quote, but it's either luck or just random chance. You, there, there's no good and evil. But then in the next breath, he said, but if there was a God, why would he allow evil? And so when you kind of think about that, you're like, well, wait a minute. You don't believe there's good or evil, but now you're saying— You recognize God. <laughs> you recognize, well, there's there's yeah. evil. Well, I thought there was no good or evil. Why would God let this happen? So, Which goes to the point of you know, bad things are going to happen, and we're all moral beings. There, you know, We believe we're created in God's image. But I think what separates Jesus from every other religion, two things. One is it's not based on your performance to attain God's approval. That, that separates Jesus apart from everybody because everybody else has a list. That's a big separation. It, it, it's a huge separation. But I think the other thing in this context is because everyone is like, well, why is, if there's a God, why is he so distant from suffering and pain? And, and you're like, well, just take the image of Jesus on a cross. And you realize that what's different about Jesus than all these other religious leaders is he became a part of, of suffering. He he suffered mm-hmm. and through that suffering brought salvation to the world. Exactly. It was it was, it was through the, the through the evil and the worst thing you could possibly imagine. Yeah. So to just flippantly he, say it, the, the, my point is to flippantly say, oh he's so dis you know, why yeah. why would he like Oh he he became a part of it. So mm-hmm. so don't don't make that chasm yeah, he's not distant. Yeah, that that yeah, and then you get into passages like Hebrews four that he's not unable to sympathize yeah. with our weaknesses. Well, I thought about Hebrews two eighteen because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. So it's the same thing as that idea yeah. of example. Let's let's take another break. So, Jace, are you aware that most emergencies come without warning? In the last 24 hours in Louisiana, it is more important to have a boat than a truck. That's right. (laughs) Because a lot of liquid has been falling from the skies, and we're dealing with it. Things happen, Al. So when the next one happens to you, uh, we want you to have time to pack and prepare. Uh, To do that, you need to be ready uh, before the emergency strikes. Uh, Your supplies should be ready to grab and go right away. You secure those supplies uh, at the website preparewithfill.com from our good friends at My Patriot Supply. You start with a four-week emergency food kit uh, from My Patriot Supply. They've been helping millions of Americans prepare since 2008. Uh, They're experts in self-reliance. Their four-week emergency food kits offer over 2,000 calories per day, Uh, They have heavy-duty four-layer packaging, so these kits are going to last up to 25 years, which is great. Uh, And they're sealed inside some rugged handle buckets, so you can grab them and go. Check these guys out. Go to preparewithfill.com. You're going to save $50 per kit. They ship fast and free in unmarked boxes, 
Save $50 per kit at preparewithfill.com. That's preparewithfill.com and be ready for any emergency. Yeah, I mean, I, I you brought up the kind of the apologetic on it, which was always fascinating to me that if you say, and it is the number one objection. I mean, I think any Christian apologist will tell you if you said what's the, if you ask them the question, what is the number one objection to people coming to faith in Christ? They're going to they're going to say or belief in God. They're going to say the problem of evil or the problem of suffering, which is the same thing, right? That that why, if there is a God, then why would there be so much evil? and suffering in the world. Surely a good God would not allow that. So there must not be a God. And then but the the but think about what that what that statement says. You you're you're actually testifying that there is such a thing as evil. Yeah. And and so then that moves you into another argument in apologetics, which is called the moral argument for God's existence, which says, well, if there's no God, there's no such thing as evil or bad or good. Everything that that's the whole in a naturalistic worldview, if naturalism is true and there is no God, then really there's nothing that gives me any more value than this bottle of water right here. I had a guy at my house uh, when we lived here in college ministry, and he was a young Buddhist, um, the, uh, which was the only Buddhist I had ever really shared my faith with until now. We were sitting there, and he said, I think everything you guys are talking about is just a load. I mean, I, I, this is ridiculous. He said, "There's no what you're saying is not true." And um, he had talked about his brother's experience in church, and he had been, for a lot of different reasons, had been discriminated against and 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 whatnot. I said, "Yeah, but but you realize that your your worldview is not attainable. You can't live this out." And he said, "Well, yeah, I'm living it out." And I said, "But you're not living it out." He said, well, "I'm living it out." And I had a, a cup just like that one by Phil. It's a red Solo cup. It was sitting right next to me. And I just took that thing and I just, I just cranked it. I'm just brought, t- just tore it apart and threw it on the ground. And I said, "Do you got a problem with that?" He said, "With what?" I said, "With what I just did." He said, "What'd you just do?" I said, I, I, "Did you see what I did to the cup?" He's like, "What? I'm not following you." I said, "Does that bother you?" He said, "No. Why would that bother me?" I said, "What if I did that to your brother? Would it bother you then?" He's like, "Well, yeah." I said, "Why?" He said, because it's my brother, like you can't treat people that way. And I said, yeah, but but if your worldview is true, it's all part of the cosmic force. We're all, it's all one. There's no distinguishing factor between that red solo cup and your brother. And then the same thing is true in a materialistic worldview. If all that exists is matter, that cup is matter, your brother's matter. What gives your brother any really intrinsic value over that? No, nothing. Everything that happens is a, is a result of a prior set of physical events. There's no like will, free will. There's no like meaning. There's no, it's, it's, just, there's no purpose to anything. They want to take part of it. Yeah. And then not apply the rest. But as soon as you say, as soon as you say, wait a second, that's wrong. Well, hold on a second. According to what? Yeah. See, it, your it, standard? It, that's evil. Yeah. Oh, that's not good. Cancer's bad. Why is it bad? Why is cancer bad? And everybody knows it's bad. Yeah. But so, we, but but the reason why we know it's bad is because we're testifying to the God who is there, and we're saying that it's bad because my wife, or, or in this case, my my cousin, you have value. You know, when I heard about it, I I cried. I, I prayed for you guys because I'm like, like that scares me. You know, what I mean, I I I love you, love you guys. Y'all been a huge part of my life. That that says you have value that's beyond mm. matter. And so the thing that. The, 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 so it turns out that the accusation that God's not there because evil and suffering are there, you're actually testifying that he is there because there wouldn't be such thing as evil if God's not there. there yeah. Yeah, so you, kinda, you can't escape him. I, and I, I don't and love it's it. interesting because you just put it in the context of where we are here because in verse 5 it says, So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying for him. And it's really interesting because right in that context, they bring in a weapon because they understand spiritual warfare. Which happened with y'all? You had how many sisters do you have come around you that had? That oh, had... immediately we're getting mm-hmm. calls and people mm-hmm. and, and sharing their life experiences and saying, "Come over here, let me tell you what happened yeah. to me." Let me ha-. so we can make sense of when bad things happen. That's the difference. Mm-hmm. The person who can't make sense of it is the one that says, "Why? Well, why me? I, I I shouldn't get something this bad, and there must not." So I can't make sense of it, and I don't turn to spiritual weapons. Yeah. It's interesting that the church immediately rallies to Peter's defense by praying for him. And you think, well, how stupid is that? What could what could they possibly accomplish by getting together in a house? a half a mile away and praying for this guy. Well, what they accomplished was is a miraculous escape. 
And the prayer was part of it because that's the first place he went to. And to Jason's say. point, that mm-hmm. testifies that God is involved. He's not distant. Exactly. He's getting involved. Well, I think I think what we do that that is not good is we do, we look at God from one perspective and then we look at ourselves from another. And here's my point: why why do we have kids? Because in that moment, you're taking a risk that's out of your control. They may grow up and hate your guts or do something terrible. Or something may happen to them. All human beings know this Mm -hmm. deep down in in their mind. They may not be thinking about it when they're in the process of making the kid (laughs) because it's an impulse. (laughs) But subconsciously, I think if you then applied that to why God made us the way he did, knowing that these bad things are going to happen. It, it was a risk he was willing to take because then it comes down to love and sharing life with someone. Same thing about getting married because it crossed my mind. I thought yeah. when I say I do with this woman, that I'm giving myself to a point emotionally where what if something happens to her? Yeah. And, you know, that was very difficult for me because I thought I'm opening myself up here to be hurt. And so, and, and even when we had my daughter, which is why I was kind of going down that philosophical argument, but I think a part of this, as we're talking about the theology and apologetics of it, meanwhile, there's people that are going through suffering. I'm sure there's there's been children die since we started this podcast right. yeah. in, in the globe. I mean, there are some real pain out there that's going on, but when I had my daughter who was diagnosed with having this cranial facial issue in the womb, we could we could see it. And I was like, Lisa, my first response, well, that can't be right. I mean, because in my mind, I'm like, well, I love the Lord. I, I love my wife. I love my baby. This can't be right. This, this doesn't. Two and two does not equal we have a problem. Yeah. With It was so out of my control. And unfortunately, probably because of my immaturity, it took me four months to say the same phrase that Lisa said, which is, why not me? Mm -hmm. Because the first four months, I was saying, well, why is this happening? I mean, this is, and Missy and I were bickering back and forth, you know, because the the problem became real. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, but it's a risk that subconsciously I should have known. This, this God doesn't have a chart up there. I thought about this in, in perspective of Jesus, where he's like doing every little thing in our life, as in breathing, and I'm tired, and I, I need to take a nap. So God's up there and got everybody on a chart. I mean, granted, he knows what's going to happen, but it's not that it's not that deep into it. There, there's well, they, like, it was, look, yeah, they, uh, 30 a, minutes ago, I could have died. I literally could have died if I was not paying attention. A guy, I didn't tell that story because I knew we were going here, but I'm just thinking yeah, I, I literally almost happened. lost my life 30 minutes ago, and we'd be having a different conversation right now. Well, just, yeah, so, you know, just so you know, we would have postponed the podcast. Well, let's, I appreciate uh, that. let's take another break. <laughs> so, Dad, do you know how your liver is doing? It would probably tell me. It would tell you if you were something was not right. right. That's a good point. The liver is the largest and heaviest organ in the body. Uh, 10% of all your blood, Dad, in your body is present in the liver at any one time. You want a good liver. You want a good liver. It is your body's filtration system in in one sense because everything gets thrown at it, right? And it also affects your heart and other things. Uh, The American Heart Association um, has done studies, you're three and a half times more likely to have heart failure uh, if you got liver problems. And that affects 100 million Americans a year, something they call fatty liver. Um, and your liver has 500 key functions that it performs every day. So we want to make sure that your liver is healthy. Uh, it helps you to be able to lose weight, to gain energy uh, when your liver is healthy. So there's a solution. Liver health formula, if you're struggling with this. I've had high liver enzyme numbers before. Uh, This product has helped me uh, to get my numbers back in line to feel better. It's an all-natural supplement. It contains 11 clinically proven botanicals that help recharge and protect your liver. 
So if you're looking to ignite your fat-burning metabolism, boost your energy, and transform how you look and feel, try Liver Health Formula and receive a free bottle of blood sugar formula to reduce sugar cravings when you order today. Try Liver Health Formula by going to getliverhelp.com slash unashamed to claim your free bonus gift. That's getliverhelp.com slash unashamed. I think it's it, what happens in a lot of theological discussions is is we conflate God's sovereignty with uh, determinism, and those are not the same thing. Like you know, I mean, like, All right now you're getting a little deep for me now. <laughs> well, um, God, but God being sovereign does like, not. Well, the determinism. Not, yeah, is, yeah, I don't believe that Scripture teaches. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Phil, Phil told me. Phil said the only isms that he believes in is capitalism and baptism. <laughs> So that and was nepotism. not one of those. Well, I don't believe in it either. That's my point. I think that I don't think that. Like I think God has has given humans free will, um, okay. and and mainly to your point, I, you know, I, I don't know if I say it's a risk on this part. I think God in His His sovereignty does like know what we're going to choose, but but God is a relational God. He is a yeah. so He doesn't. He's I don't think the Bible teaches that He's forcing His creatures into relationship with Him. I think that God wants all of those who would freely come to him to come, and he's provided a way for that in Jesus. And, but I think that's where this discussion goes. But another aspect of this that I think is important, uh, when you think about the entrance of suffering into the world, like when, when did suffering enter the world? In Genesis chapter 3, when when Adam and Eve sinned for the first time is when the, the earth was cursed, and, and God said, cursed be the ground that you work, you know, you're going to work it by the sweat of your brow. It's going to create thorns and thistles for you. To the woman, he said, you're going to increase mm-hmm. your your pain and childbearing. And there's the the whole conflict between husband and wife and headship and all that. And all this complexity enters the world when Adam and Eve sin for the first time. Their eyes are open and they realize that they were naked. Now well, they, they were also separated from that tree of life, which th- then brought death into the exactly. equation. Exactly, and and think about the tree of life. That was my point. So there's a, there's the 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 cherubims, which we we mentioned in the last podcast about the the re, the empty tomb, where they had the two angels there that yeah. you know. This, but they they guarded that that entrance to 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 the tree of life. And the question yeah. is why why would God do that? And the reason is, I, I think I think this is true. I think the reason why God, I think even that is an act of grace on God's part. He, God could not allow his creatures to exist autonomously from him. That, that actually, the definition of existing autonomously away from God, that the biblical, like the biblical word for that, to be out of the presence of the Lord and exist, you know what that is? It's hell. It's hell. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so to allow humans to stay in that state, it, w- it would have been God allowing us to live in hell or making us live in hell. So the reason why he blocked that tree off was actually an act of grace. So when we think about sin and pain and suffering entering into the world, that's a result of not being connected to the tree of life. But even that is an act of grace, because to live in my own will, in my own autonomy, not under his kingdom, not under his reign and his rule, away from his presence— as much as I might think I want that, to actually experience that would be hell. Well, and I love the idea Jay's brought up about the idea of value and realizing every relationship in in your circle is so valuable. Uh, and that's the way I was when I wrote with Lisa. My first prayer was, I, Father, help me be faithful yeah. in the fight. Because, you know, we're yeah. fighting this thing, but I want to be faithful. I, and because I love her so much, but I opened myself up to that risk a long time ago. There was a young couple that had a, that found out their baby in the womb was had something that probably wouldn't survive the pregnancy, but for sure wouldn't live long once the baby was born. And so the, they were like, well, just take the opportunity for pain away. Just go ahead and do an abortion now. But instead they said, oh, you don't understand. We value our baby so much. They every day they prayed, they sang together while the baby was in the womb, and then when the baby was born, sure enough, within sixty hours that baby passed away. But they said the time we had, we had those eight months, and then we had those few wow. hours was so well, valuable to us. And I thought that's how you look at life instead well, right. of just something we discard. And I, we I think life. from one, a one biblical thing, one oh, thing I've ahead. noticed about the human race, and one thing follows them ninety percent. Tears. Yeah. They hear a story. 
let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified. This is at the front end of the book of Acts. Both Lord and cry. When the people heard this, here's my point. They were cut to the heart. Mm -hmm. I watch it over and over and over. And when you, I'm standing in the water with them, all they've heard, I've never seen them before in my life. But when they hear about what God did through Jesus and his death on the cross and his resurrection, 90% tears flow. Well, I, I was mean, I'm not a value. guy trying to get tears out of them. I just noticed mm -hmm. that when they're standing there and they're fixing to die to sin and be buried, the old you will be gone. And you're fixing to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God, yeah. which guarantees you will live forever. Resurrection. So I was well, riding on it. I wanted and, to make and look, a... the tears are always there. I just never noticed it till a few years back. But I said, they all cry. Why are they crying? It's life. I was going to make a point, though. I think what helps us when we think about the idea of pain and suffering and Jesus working the miracles, I thought about that statement in Acts 9, 34, when Peter, the guy had been paralyzed for eight years, he said, Jesus Christ heals you. Well, the backdrop of all the miraculous and all the healings and all what Jesus did and does is that he's alive. Yeah. You couldn't make that statement if he was dead. Yeah. And so when you think about why the number one subject that they highlighted in the book of Acts was the resurrection of Jesus, what we view as the uttermost pain and suffering of the world in the context of death is not a problem from God's perspective makes you then understand, oh, well, it's not as bad as I thought if these babies who die are going to live forever. That's right. And so I do think the resurrection is the foundation for which all of the supernatural powers and miracles have to be in context mm -hmm. of. We have something greater than whether you get a miracle or not in this situation that we're talking about. One is rescued, one is not. But the resurrection of Jesus is the backdrop. He's alive. Yeah. So uh, next time we get back to this text, we'll actually get into how secure Peter was in that Uh continue to pray for us. At least I appreciate all you guys and your support. Uh, my, my ask for prayers is uh, faithfulness in the fight. So that's what we ask for. So anyway, we'll see you next time on Unashamed. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, Subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.